Welcome back, everyone. Dr. TEMD here, back with another gripping episode of MRI Physics Explained. Today, we're going to be continuing our quest and begin talking about signal localization. If you didn't see the previous episode, I highly recommend you go check it out using the link above. It's a little lengthy, but it sets the stage for everything we're going to discuss from here on out. And a lot of this will seem, quite frankly, perverse and unnatural if you try starting your MRI physics journey here. And if you like these lectures, please subscribe, like, and comment to support the channel, follow Dr. T.E. on Instagram, or consider donating using the links below. With that said, let's do a quick recap. We started our journey describing the nuclear magnetic resonance phenomenon where we discovered that if we put hydrogen protons in a magnetic field, they will align either with or against the magnetic field. But more importantly, slightly more protons will align with the field than against the field, creating a net magnetization in the direction of the field. We are literally building a magnet inside the body. Now, if we can impart some energy to this magnet at the natural frequency it wants to rotate at, the Larmor frequency, we can push the magnet in our body away from the axis of the main external magnetic field. And it will start precessing like a top about the B0 axis, as seen here. So how do we do this? How do we push a magnet inside our body? We fight fire with fire. We want to move a magnet in our body, so we'll hit it with another magnetic field, alternating at the Larmor frequency. Now something amazing happens. If we place a coil parallel to the z-axis, which is the axis aligned with the main magnetic field, we'll record a decaying sinusoidal current in our coil, also known as T2 decay. See previous lecture for the details on why this occurs. More accurately, we'll record a complex looking signal coming from the entire slice of the body part we're imaging. But we can reason that this signal is made up of the signal coming from every single voxel summed together, right? We choose the size of the voxel, it's a construct. We could make the entire slice one giant voxel if we wanted to. While not recommended for clinical imaging, it would make things nice for the core exam. So we can choose a voxel size and can reason that this voxel here, containing fat, has a T2 decay curve that looks like this. This voxel here, containing soft tissue, has a T2 decay curve that looks like this. And this voxel here containing fat will have a similar looking T2 decay curve to the first voxel. All added up together gives us the complex raw signal we record in our coil. Furthermore, if we could somehow find a way to break down this raw complex signal back into the individual T2 decay curves coming from each voxel and spatially locate where these voxels are in the slice, we can then choose a time to compare the individual signals let's call it TE, and calculate the amplitude at that time point and place it in the correct voxel it's originating from. It is these differences in measurement that give us a contrasted picture and the localization of the signal from each voxel that tells us where to correctly place that value on the image. Because in the end, we're just plugging numbers into a matrix, right? Woo, that felt like a lecture in itself. So this is the goal. This is the stuff all your MRI physics dreams, or more likely nightmares, are made of. We need to localize the signal coming from each individual voxel in three dimensions, along the z-axis, x-axis, and finally, y-axis. And we will do this in a step-by-step, -step, logical, and hopefully sensible way for once. So grab your bell bottoms, grow out your hair, and let's travel back to the 70s before any of this was figured out and put ourselves in the shoes of the MRI physics pioneers with a major, major problem to solve. First, we will tackle signal localization along the z-axis. Let's start by going back to this diagram. We have a patient lying down in the center of our MRI machine where the main magnetic field is the most concentrated and most homogeneous. We ask ourselves, what is the Larmor frequency all these protons want to precess at if energized? Well, we can calculate this, right? From the formula for the Larmor frequency, gamma is a constant, so it all comes down to what is the magnetic field that these protons are experiencing. 
In this case, all protons along the length of the body are subject to B0, and the Larmor frequency will be constant throughout the body. So if we apply an alternating magnetic field, our RF pulse, at the Larmor frequency, every proton from head to toe will precess at the same frequency, and our receiver coil, somewhere in here, will record a complex decaying sinusoidal current coming from the entire body, which is not helpful. So that won't work. How can we be more selective? Huh? Mom, I'm recording a lecture for all my internet friends. You're embarrassing me. Try what? No, that's absurd. Fine, we'll try it. Just leave us alone, okay? <clears throat> Sorry about that. Per suggestion from a loyal subscriber, let's try this. What if we place two coils of wire, one at the head of the patient and one at the feet, and run current through these coils to create an electromagnet. How would this affect our main magnetic field? We would alter the magnetic field so it now looks something like this. The coil near the head will produce a magnetic field. We'll call this B1. That will add to the main magnetic field, B0. You'll notice this effect is greatest right next to the coil and gets weaker and weaker as we increase the distance. The same happens with the coil at our feet. It'll produce a magnetic field that will add to B0. Greatest right next to the coil, dropping off as we move away. So what would the Larmor frequency be in this situation? It'll be the main magnetic field plus the magnetic field added by the extra electromagnets. And notice that the Larmor frequency will now vary linearly from head to toe, just like the summed magnetic field, but not uniquely, right? This point here shares the same frequency as this point here, and therefore, this point will have the same Larmor frequency as this point. So if we tuned our RF pulse to this point, we would excite this slice, but also excite this slice. So better, but still, not helpful. So what do we do? Well, I have an idea. Let's go back to this idea but make one slight but important change. Now the interesting thing about electromagnets is if you run current in the opposite direction through them, they produce a magnetic field in the opposite direction as well. So if we run a reverse current through one of the coils, let's choose the coil at the head. We produce a magnetic field in the opposite direction as B0, which will subtract from the main magnetic field. This will give us a magnetic field that looks like this. We have now created a magnetic field that uniquely varies from head to toe. And thus the Larmor frequency will also vary uniquely from head to toe. To excite a slice in the body, we simply need to turn these electromagnets on and apply an RF pulse at the desired Larmor frequency of the corresponding slice we wish to image. All signal our receiver coil slash antenna records will thus come only from this slice of the body. One last thing we should mention. Some of you watching this may say, wait a second, any slice we select will never correspond to a single frequency because the magnetic field will vary within that slice. And you're exactly right. We can never achieve a perfect single frequency, nor would we want to because that would select for an infinitesimally small slice. We actually need some thickness to the slice, and in fact, we can even choose what the thickness is by selecting the range of frequencies we want to include in our RF pulse. We call this range the transmit bandwidth. Some of you may have heard this term, and this is exactly what it means. And I'm sure there are a bunch of poor postdoctoral students whose sole job in life is to design the perfect mix of alternating magnetic frequencies for slice selection. Residency doesn't sound so bad now, huh? Just kidding. We love you, Slice Select people. Keep up the good work. Yay! Finally, for those of you taking boards or interested in advanced MRI physics topics, in 3D MRI acquisition modes, we replace the Slice Select gradient with a second phase encoding gradient. And one more thing to point out. There's a special point along the body where the magnetic field equals exactly that of the main magnetic field, B0. You can see this occurs right where these gradients meet and cancel each other out. 
This point has a special name called the isocenter, which will be an important reference point in future lectures. So we have accomplished the first major hurdle. We've developed a creative method for exciting a slice of the body along the z-axis. We simply create a gradient magnetic field varying linearly from head to toe and tune our RF pulse to the unique Larmor frequency of the slice we want to image. Next up, signal localization along the x-axis. And that's all. Here are the ways to support the channel. Creative Commons images used for this lecture. A disclaimer on the images and animations. And we'll see you next time. This is Dr. TEMD signing off.